Providence Public Schools and Central Falls, all of the districts in the state have the green light to return to in-person learning. Now, that doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen by and large. There's going to be some staggered returns, some sort of hybrid models as well. But within this conversation, there's certainly no question that there's going to be some element of remote, distant, virtual learning that will take place. And we've seen a lot of pushback from some parents and certainly from the teachers' unions um, that have said, hey, look, our buildings aren't necessarily COVID-ready, and there's so much uncertainty around COVID-19 anyway that, look, we don't really know for sure how long in-person learning is going to be able to extend, and there's probably going to be some form of distance learning implemented either in a hybrid model or, in the case of Warwick, full-on distance learning. So in this conversation, we've heard from public policy leaders, the governor herself, the commissioner of education, Angelica Infante Green. We've heard from the teachers unions. We've certainly heard from Bob Walsh of the NEARI. But how about those who are most impacted by any decision around virtual learning? The students themselves. So today on Bartholomew Town, an exciting episode as we welcome a few students here in Rhode Island who offered their insight into what distance learning has been like for them and what they'd like to see going forward, as well as Stephen Heath, the executive director of Fab Newport, who, as you'll hear, Ride, the Rhode Island Department of Education, reached out to him asking him to explore what students want, what they need when it comes to distance learning. So today we have Gabby Brown, who was a Rogers student who transferred to the Met School, as well as Debbie Adekume, a senior at Classical High School. Now, both of these kids have been participants in Fab Newport and the PVD Young Makers Program for over two years. And what you're going to hear today is, in many ways, when we think about the silver linings or what we're going to learn about society um, and how to improve it going forward after COVID-19, I think a lot of what, again, you'll hear today is going to reflect where education may go in the future and how we can use remote learning and distance learning and, and just getting out of that traditional 30 kids in a classroom with one teacher um, on a campus model going forward. So again, the students' voices in all of this, we've heard from the policymakers, we've heard from the unions, we've heard from the parents quite a bit, and, and to some extent students, but not enough. So I'm very pleased to present this episode for all of you today, and I hope you enjoyed very much some tremendous insight. And uh, by the way, they even get to ask me some questions at the end of the episode. Look out. Going deep here on Bartholomew Town. So thanks for tuning in as always. By the way, if you want some exclusive content, like last month in August, we had Ted Nisi of WPRI and Ian Donis of the Publix Radio giving their insight into the presidential election. In July, we had Dr. Luis Daniel Munoz kind of summing up where we really stand with COVID-19 from a medical and public policy perspective here in the Ocean State you can get exclusive content just like that by becoming a Beantown Insider. And for as little as $3 per month, you can help sustain the journalism, opinion, analysis, and entertainment that Beantown has become known for. Just head over to patreon.com slash Town or click the support link wherever you're listening right now. Okay, let's get right to it. Students' perspective on distance learning here in Rhode Island. About three weeks ago, I got a message from... Um, Steve Osborne, who's the director of innovation for Ride, and he reached out and said, Steve, we're interested in figuring out how distance learning can be improved. Could you do a statewide outreach program? And so we have a website called improveddistancelearningri.org. And so anyone who wants to talk about this, we can set up an interview. And so here we are. And, uh, you know, Debbie and Gabby have been with us for years um, as students and interns. Um, and so we're just trying to, you know, figure this out. And we, we want to hear from those who are most impacted, who are the students, any student, K through 12, who lives in Rhode Island. And you can go to the website, you can book uh, an interview or you can email us. And if you have a group of students who want to be interviewed together, we can arrange anything that makes sense. And the idea is to collect as many voices as possible and let the world know how we can improve distance learning. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll listen is that I think when people hear the term distance learning, they often feel like it's a computer. But we like to think about it as 
learning just away from school. So a computer could be part of it, but there's so many things that somebody can do in their neighborhood or their backyard or down by the edge of the water. So let's maybe expand on the dish, the uh, definition of what distance learning is. Yeah, that's really fascinating because now we hear uh, and, and we're taping the week before Labor Day weekend, and this will air right after Labor Day. But so just yesterday, the governor announced, Governor Raimondo, hey, look, you know, it's, we're, we're giving the green light to all but two districts to go back to full in-person learning here in Rhode Island. But we're also encouraging everybody to sort of explore outdoor spaces and sort of think alternatively. So there's a little bit of a, you know, kind of a conflict there. When it comes to distance learning, though, it was a lot of trial and error for sure. I, I mean, I know a lot of teachers are, are listening to this program, and I've certainly heard from, from many people who have said, hey, look, we're, we're making this up as we go along, and there's a lot of things that, that seem to connect, and there's a lot of things that seem to just not work. So let's get right into your experiences, and we'll start with Debbie. Kind of talk about distance learning from your perspective, and what's your message to the people who are deciding policy right now in the state just from your experience on the ground up and what you've learned sort of in this project here? Um, so distance learning for me in March wasn't easy at all. It was a very rough transition, especially because it gave us one week with little information to um, just change our entire life and start a new type of schooling. And I am kind of like a very hands-on learning learner and visual learner. And it wasn't like um, a great, option for me, but I, I did it and I went through it. But, um, when I entered the summer, I wanted, I, I kept, I've been doing summer programs for the past year. And this year I knew that there wasn't going to be like an in-person summer program or anything of that sort. So I wanted to do something. Um, so I worked with people and makers and we basically that program just gave me a perspective of what distance really can look like. For September and for the fall, um, I was in this program and I was able to learn as much as I learned in school. But I didn't have to be in that space. I didn't have to be with people to learn. It like um, Steve said, it was a distance learning. It was a learning that occurred after um, away from classrooms. But I still learned as much as I usually learn in classroom. So I think that that program just gave me a, a big perspective of what my my school system should look like. And I think that a lot of what I would tell the, the people that are making policies and people that are, are um, governing our school system is that I want a new system that caters to the students. Like the, the system that caters to our need and not the needs that society has placed upon students. We can find like good things in this very chaotic time and try and revolutionize the conventional way that we've been going to school. We don't have to stick to those old ways. We can always move forward from there. Like, I feel like in this time, a lot of people are trying to just hold on to everything that they can hold on to and just try to um, just hold on to the change. So nothing, nothing drastic can happen because a lot of people don't like change. And I, not, this kind of change is not pretty at all. But I feel like if we can look past that, we can see the, the ways where we can make the old system better than what it's been before and um, still con- convenient for this time. I think that um, students have learning experience outside of school every day before even coronavirus and this chaotic stuff. People go to um, different classes, extracurricular activities. They get a lot of learning experiences from that. I had learning experience from, experiences from my PBD Young Makers um, some school year program. So and I feel like if we can use these learning experiences to teach students real life skills, about what they will need when they leave school, the real life world. I think that that's what our our class should look like. Because if the if real life experiences that they're learning, that they're getting from every day after the school doesn't count in school, when they graduate, there's no how, there's no way they're gonna use those real life skills properly and um, get into the real world with this real problems. And it's just, I feel like the, the the school system now and the learning experiences students have outside of school are clashing, and that shouldn't be what our school looks like. It should be an assimilation of both of them, going into school to learn these real life skills and going outside to use that experience to make your life better, to make it more evolved, to just evolve our way of living. And if our school isn't a place that prepares our students to succeed outside of school, 
I don't know what we need a school for. Why can't we just keep going to after school programs? So I think that during this time, our policymakers and our decision makers should look at how they can assimilate the real life skills that we have, um, that the students are having every day in our schools and just as, um, do that, assimilate that together and try and, and help us do distance learning outside of classrooms in a safe way that people are not going to get sick, but people are also going to get the real life skills they need to um, go out in the world and um, make the place a better place to live in. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And that's, it's so true that we, we crave for normalcy right now, right? Yet, sometimes when we think back to what that normal was, there were so many gaps. And look, people talk about health equity and social justice right now. And those are profound and highly important topics. There's no question. But there's also just the day-to-day lives of students and even folks who are in the workforce now that maybe there's an opportunity here in COVID-19 to improve. Gabby, I'm curious about sort of the same question, your experiences and how you'd like to see distance learning sort of recalibrate, reshape how we think about education in general. And especially right now as distance learning is being pushed out as sort of like this well, you know, here's a negative option. We we, we got to stay away with the idea is to get back to quote unquote normal uh, when in fact, you know, we may be able to move forward in, in a new direction based on what we've learned. So um, my learning, my distance learning experience was really difficult because I had like a really bad concussion. So I was on my computer for like nine hours every day straight, pushing out a whole bunch of work and mm-hmm. reading we had to read on our computers. Everything was just there. And from my experience and hearing the experiences of my peers, I realized that distance learning needs to become more empathetic and more flexible because I feel like at least when it started, teachers didn't have a long time. So they threw it together pretty fast. And it was just one system that everybody had to use. And the reality is every student is different. Every teacher is different. And there's no way that we can all learn in the same manner. So from that, I also like to stress what Steve said about like open space learning, because especially with kids who like Debra, Debbie that can't like learn from the computer like that, they need to be hands on or if they're like me and can't stare at their computer all day. Open space learning is very important because you can still get the fundamentals from your um, education, but not in front of your computer. And I interned with Fab Newport this summer, and they actually did open space science classes that were socially distanced at the Norman Bird Sanctuary. And I remember more stuff that I did there than my whole science class on during distance learning. Yeah, it's all about experience, and and of course, the, I'm I'm right there with you. I mean, if you if you ask me, and and one of my good friends is is a teacher at. Uh, at, at a, a charter school here and in, in, in Rhode Island and, and his experience of not only the students, but his own fatigue from teaching on Zoom all day. And then what does that do to the students? How can you possibly engage everyone? And this particular charter school has a lot of outdoor space. It's in, it's in a rural part of the state. And finally, you know, their administration said, all right, let's just, why are we doing science on Zoom? Let's get the kids out in the woods. Let's go go birding let's go explore the the, the hands-on science that we can do that safely so this is so fascinating because I wasn't really prepared for the notion of expanding the concept of distance learning which is something that you all are way ahead of not only me but certainly I think even the administration here in Rhode Island because in I've been at every one of the governor's press conferences and I have never heard them mention yeah look they'll say we should go outdoors but expanding the concept of distance learning. Let's, let's talk about, um, back to Debbie, if we could, let, let, let's talk about, you know, there's, there's, it's scary right now. You know, the, the masks, the gloves, the hand sanitizer, it's a scary time. And there's a lot of anxiety that is justifiable. How has that impacted you as a student, regardless of distance learning, in-person, in-person learning? How, how is that affecting you on a daily basis? Um. So with the mask and the safety precautions, it's been a lot of, um, it's been very nerve wracking, especially with me. I have a little bit of, 
asthma and wearing the max all day long is just not feasible for me. Yep. And I think that that, that that raises a big point about um, the mental health of students, which have not been taken um, very, very, um, very um, important before. People have not taken that very seriously before because I um, when wearing a mask all day long and I'm very cautious of not giving on putting people and walking around in danger. And then that gives me some kind of anxiety in me. Like I need to take this off, but I don't want to give, I don't want to, I don't want to give whatever she has. I don't want to get whatever she has. or I don't want to give her whatever I have. And um, I don't, when doing school, when I was doing distance learning, uh, I didn't have a, a, a one person to talk to. And I know a lot of students didn't have this one person to talk to or this person to rent to. So I think that if we can start, um, elevating the seriousness of mental health in our school system and trying to um, find a feasible ways to, uh, for students to connect to one person or for them to be mental resources at our schools. I think that a lot of students will find this transition easier and also take and also be um, healthy people because if our mental health isn't stable, I don't think you're, you can be a physically stable person. Or at least I can. So, I think that our school system should now take this opportunity to make our mental health structure a little bit more visible in our school. Discover over 200 episodes of Rhode Island's podcast of record, the Bartholomew Town Podcast, on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your pods. Or head over to our website, ripodcast.com. Gabby, when if, if, if you had a chance right now, let's say on the other end of the Zoom call, there was every student in the state of Rhode Island was listening right now. And maybe they will. Hey, who knows, right? It's, you never know what's going to happen. What, what's your message to them? Because obviously this is, this is a scary time. It's, it's the most unusual time I think we've all experienced, no matter any of our age, frankly, um, you know, through war and, and all kinds of other chaos. This is one of the most bizarre experiences. But what would you say to other students out there in Rhode Island right now as far as getting kind of their head wrapped around where we are embracing some of what Debbie was talking about with that mental health component of things. How does that, what's your message? I think it would be very important to reach out to your peers to share your experiences because I know that like when I was very isolated during distance learning, I was having issues and I kind of was very hard on myself because you, you're not performing to the best of your ability, especially if you're really wrapped around your school performance, then you get really stressed because you're not to the par of like what you're used to. So I think it's very important that if you can reach out to other students just to like talk about what you're going through or like your fears or anything for the new school year. And if you can't, at least just give yourself a little break academically or if it's like your sports performance, just anything, because it's a really hard time right now. And I don't think anyone should expect themselves to be like up to par with what their normal is. Yeah, that's unreasonable. And, you know, I think that, yeah, that goes across the board, not just for students. I I think it's, it's a difficult thing to expect that, all right, everything's going to be beautiful every single day anyways, but especially during these uncertain times, Steve, I'm wondering if you can jump back in and, I'm wondering the experiences that you, the, some of the other feedback that you've gotten through this, um, frankly, investigation that is just, just so critical. And, and I, I think this, the, the, this work you're doing is just going to blow the lid off of a lot of the uh, misinformation that's out there when it comes to distance learning. But what, what else are you hearing from other, other students, maybe teachers, anecdotally? Yeah. So Gabby said something that was really interesting. So kind of like not up to par. So one of the questions I like to ask people and I've been asking since kind of the COVID hit is like, where are the silver linings? So in other words, so Gabby, can you think of a spot where you've actually maybe excelled or learned something about yourself personally or from like a learning standpoint where it's like, oh my gosh, I had, can you, can you think of anything? Uh, yeah, during like this time with distance learning, I had the opportunity with like my free time to apply for some grants. And I got a grant that's like based on learning journeys, basically. And you pick something that you've always wanted to explore. So I chose photography and I was accepted for a grant to like explore photography starting at the end of the school year into the middle of the summer. So I think that's 
big silver lining for me because I think without this time, I wouldn't have had the time to uh, throw myself into something new. And who supported that journey? In what way? Like the who, where I received the grant or... Well, you had, I think you've had some mentoring and like, so... Yeah, so um, the program that I got the grant through, Grip Tape, I received like a, a mentor basically who I checked in every two weeks with, but also Fab Newport really support the learning journey because through my internship, they I was allowed to take pictures of the different programs, like NEX and that kind of stuff. So I got to really hone in on and focus on different photography skills. And I mentored with Josie. And through her, like, when we had free time, she'd take me to different art studios, galleries, and Steve got me in touch with, uh, like, an actual photographer that gave me little pointers and stuff along the way. Thank you. Hey, That's and great. How about you, Debbie? Have you learned anything about yourself or just in this time that might be considered a silver lining? Yeah, I think that um, I've learned during this time that my voice is really big and it can go a long way. I think that that's like through the interviews I do, a lot of students have pointed out that out. Um, this summer I started with a little group of students, this Hackett initiative to like revolutionize the, the education system and just change, evolve it to be something the students are passionate about. And like it, it's kind of connects to Gabby's work because she used this time to to, to um, engage with photography, something she wanted to do a long time ago, I guess. And and she's using this time to to explore different kind of um, learning experiences that she can get. And I think that that's what our school should, should look like. Our, our school should be a place where students can grow as a person and just evolve with the different passions that they're very I'm passionate about and if this if our schools gives us that um that that that, that leeway to to go into different kind of fields and not just the core math and english that we have been doing a long time ago if our school gives us that path to go into the different kind of skills and vocational skills and um talking points and just stuff like that i think that our students will evolve into like more widen have widened perspective on life and be more diverse in their thinking. So with this Hackett initiative, we're just trying to change how our school looks like. It's like, we don't want to be in front of the school board or in school computer all day long. We want to go outside and get real life skills so that we can become um, diverse human beings. So yeah, that's what I've used my summer to be. That's like a silver lining for my summer, just starting this Hackett initiative because I didn't know that I had the power to do something this major. It's incredible. This is incredible stuff here. And let me ask you this kind of a, a, a quick last question here. Would you rather, you know, the governor is given the green light for many districts to go back to school still, you know, 17% or so of, of students in Rhode Island haven't been given the green light to go back into in-person learning. But um, let's start with Gabby. Would you rather go back to the traditional in-person learning um, or kind of continue to explore different methods through distance learning or some kind of hybrid of it all? What's your take on that? I would love if we had the chance to explore more options through distance learning. I feel like the best way for us to like get the most out of our education is if every student has an opinion or power in what they're doing. And if, I don't know, if we could all like just collaborate and maybe just have like wider options it's not like go to school or stay home like if we could maybe like open space anything like that just have more options for kids to explore so if you get through the year and like one thing doesn't work for you then you can try out something else same question debbie my answer is very similar to gabby's i would definitely want to explore more distance learning option like she said, the option of staying home and going to school is not feasible, especially because that system doesn't work for everybody. And right now, I think we should all be fighting for an education system that works for everybody. So if we can have a widened um, option of what to do with our school system and just own our school, um, our school, or the, our learning experiences, I think that it will be a feasible option, an effective option for many students because they will have the option 
to learn what they want to learn and grow as a person wanting their perspective. So yeah, I definitely want to explore different distance learning options. And one more time, Steve, where can people reach out to you or if they want to contribute to this this uh, broad conversation that we're having today on distance learning, moving learning forward, which by the way, that's something that you've made a career out of for sure in, in terms of Fab Newport, but beyond just even just beyond the concept of COVID-19, how can people get in touch with you and, and keep this project going? Yeah, they can reach me at steve at fabnewport.org. Always eager to chat with people. And then if you want to talk more about this in terms of improved distance learning and start sending ideas to uh, the powers that be, improveddistancelearningri.org. Debbie has been conducting interviews. We have students conducting interviews. We have teachers conducting interviews. So we've got about 10 different people who are working on collecting the voices of uh, our students. And let you know you can hear these two young people speak eloquently about what makes sense for them. So how about Gabby or Debbie? How about a question for Bill? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I wouldn't. Okay. Um, since you said you grew up in Rhode Island, mm-hmm. what schools did you go to, and how did you like like the experience? Great question. I went to Charaho, and then I graduated from uh, URI. So starting with Charaho, I had some great teachers and some some good friends there. But it was not diverse. It was, and I had some some teachers that were, you know, I was even telling someone last night, you know, and this could happen anywhere. But I had a Spanish teacher that didn't speak Spanish. I had a Latin teacher that didn't speak Latin, you know, and there was an element of mailing it in. But there were also were people who I'm still in touch with today, teachers that I consider part of the reason why I got into the work I do with either music or with politics and podcasting and, and news are some of the specific teachers I had there. So it was a balance, and I'm sure that's the case anywhere. Um, I think the lack of diversity of thought more so than even of you know, backgrounds or identity was what was most troubling. Um, when I went to URI, I was fortunate because I was able to go uh, without having to take any loans, basically, through, through, through a number of different factors. So I was able to graduate from college debt-free, there I found my niche in the political science department and playing in a band and a lot of those extracurricular activities. So yeah, growing up in Rhode Island, what really kept me going were those things outside of school, my music um, and, and hiking and the, the things that I really was passionate about. And I made it out in one piece. I'll say that. So we need to read that. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I was going to say sometimes barely in one piece, but. <laughs> Gabby, have you got a question for Bill? Uh, yes, but I think Debbie had something else to say. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask, so you would agree that those after school stuff should be what is in our classrooms, right? They should be weighed as equal. I had an amazing, one of the amazing teachers I had was really forward thinking and I had a study hall. And eventually it was even during, I can't remember if it was gym class or something like that, but it was, and, and this particular teacher, um, he invited me to play drums in his band. It was, so I was like a 16 year old kid playing with, with my adult teachers, uh, filling in on drums. And eventually he started to put, um, myself and maybe three or four other musicians, and he would say, all right, instead of study hall, or he would talk to somebody and get us out of some sort of extracurricular class. And we would actually be able to go to the music room and he would let us in. And then he would say, all right, I'll see you guys later. Your assignment is to write a song or your assignment is to everybody move shift instruments. Now you're playing bass guitar and I'll see you later. And that changed my life, changed the trajectory of my life. And it motivated me to get to school. And next, you know, we're getting there at six in the morning to practice for this, this new class that wasn't even a real class. So my experience is definitely that the emphasis should be on um, not just passions, but also uh, certainly passions and new ways of thinking. Because boy, do you learn a lot about communicating and teamwork when you're forced into a situation with people and you have to create something together. And that could be in any sort of lab setting. Could be art, could be music, could be science, innovation, tech, 
when you when you put people in a room and especially when there's limited direction, I found that to be really the most profound part of my high school experience. So great question. <laughs> So um, my question was that at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that you're very hesitant to get into politics and podcasts and journalism because you didn't feel like you were as qualified as other people to be in it because you had no like educational background in it. Uh, But what like finally pushed you over the edge to actually start and like get the ball rolling? I became a caller to there's a radio station in Rhode Island called WPRO. And it leans conservative, to say the least. Sometimes, you know, you're screaming back at the... If you listen to it for five minutes, sometimes I'll play it for friends and think, what, what is this? You know, who, what is going on here? But I became somewhat obsessed with this station, um, 6.30 a.m., an a.m. radio station. And what it is, is they have the, the host will come out and they'll, make some, they'll say some opinion. And then the audience calls up and you can get on air. And so... I began calling in in 2016 when I moved back to Rhode Island as I created a character, William in Newport. And I would call multiple times a day and start debating the hosts <laughs> and start, you know, reaching out to the hosts afterwards and saying, you know, hey, it was, you know, uh, nothing personal. You know, I didn't mean to attack you or whatever, but, you know, hey, I disagree with you on this and started started finding my voice through that. And that gave me a lot of confidence to say, oh, okay, well, if I can hold my own on this radio station a couple of times per day, talking to people that are the complete opposite of me in many cases politically, uh, not always, but a lot of times, and and getting to the point where it's entertaining because other people would call up after and be like, oh, that guy was a nut or that guy was funny or whatever. Um, that gave me a lot of confidence. And then fast forward three years and I became a a fill-in host on that same radio station. So now I haven't been during COVID because of the the stations. Long story short, there's no fill-in host because the building's closed, but I became a substitute for the hosts on the station. Um, You know, from that experience of calling in, that gave me the courage, I guess, to do my podcast. And then from the podcast, I became someone who ended up on that radio station. So Really, I give a lot of credit to that radio station, WPRO. Um, but also my wife, Gabriella, was very supportive. You know, she's, she's an artist. She studies at RISD. She's first-generation immigrant from Brazil. You know, so, and my bandmate and my band, Silver Teeth. So her encouragement also made me say, yeah, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Nobody listens. I've had that happen plenty of times before with music projects, so. Yeah. So, Bill, something you said there, too, is like, like in that band room yeah where you're is the diversity of relationships you know ken robinson just passed sir ken robinson who had the profound ted talk about education and one of the yep. lines that i say probably once a week is that schools are still organized kids by date of manufacture right but most of us thrive in an environment where there's a diversity of people because Like as an older kid, you can help a younger kid and that gives something to you. And then the younger kid has this like, oh my God, look at that older kid likes me. And then who knows, maybe there's something a younger kid that can teach an older kid. And then you gave an opportunity to your teacher there in that school to share his greatest gift, right? And because I think the greatest thing that we get as human beings is when we start to give away our gifts, right? And so like Debbie has worked in the libraries where she's been able to give away the things that she has learned and Gabby works with kids. And so it's like, it's like, that's, that's like the center of of human existence is that ability to transcend ourselves and give our gifts away. And and you do that not by putting like 500 ninth graders together where they're kind of like a festering womb, but we start mixing it up. Mix it up. And I, I 1000% agree with that. That's what I learned when I got to Brooklyn, you know, when I got to New York and you get it a little bit, I got a little bit in at URI as well um, as a student there. But once I got to New York, I realized, wow, age is out the window, genders identi- gender identity is out the window, race is out the window, language is out the window. And we're all in this together and we all have something to teach each other and we're going to lift each other up with that, like you say, those gifts. And 
that's that's something that is uh, I think critical to put into education and um, and, and education policy, really, because I'm sure most teachers would agree that hey, look, we need to be able to empower students' gifts and let those be the driving force of what we're doing in school versus you know, like you say, five hundred of pretty homogenous people sitting around in a lunchroom, you know, throwing an apple across the lunchroom. <laughs> This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Wow, I don't know about you, but I continue to be extremely inspired by the youth of Rhode Island, and it's been great to feature a number of different uh, members, I guess, of Generation Z and some of the young millennials here on B-Town over the last few months, and we're going to continue to do just that. Stay tuned throughout September. There's going to be a lot of programming surrounding the election, both local and national, um, in the next couple of months. We're going to have some media personalities on, kind of getting back to B-Town's bread and butter while mixing in the continued coverage of the social justice movements going on and, of course, COVID-19. For daily content, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Bill Bartholomew or join the Bartholomew Town Podcast Facebook group. All right. Hope you have a great week. We'll talk to you on Friday. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.